Hello everyone, LC Hold here, and this is my update for the week of May the 25th, coming up on the last week of May. And this week we we're, we're, you know, we got full house. As you can see, we've gone full Brady Bunch. So everybody wave to who's above you and who's below you and to the side. And then we're going to introduce what our topic is going to be today. Today's topic is going to be Scream. The first two films in the Scream series, of which there are now four films, soon to be five, as was just announced. Um, and really? so we're going to... We're going to talk about this series uh, starting today. We're probably going to have to do this as a two-parter, do Scream 3 and 4 on another show. Uh, but today, I think, will be the high point of the Scream series, at least for me. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm not the hugest fan of Scream 3, and oh, I, have, God. I have some problems with 4, but, you know, we'll, we'll address that when we get there. Uh, today, though, let's start off by talking about Scream Part 1. And it all began, Scream Part 1, with a fellow named Kevin Williamson, an aspiring actor from North Carolina who moved to L.A. to become famous. He was a writer, too. He took some classes in writing, but he was told early on by a teacher that he had no talent as a writer. <laughs> the teacher told him, just stop now, kid, because there's no way you're going to make it anywhere. Um, this actually went on to inspire Kevin Williamson to write a screenplay called uh, Killing Mrs. Tingle, which yeah. became, a movie, became a movie called uh, Teaching Mrs. Tingle, because when that movie came out, Columbine had just happened, so they didn't like the idea of killing a teacher. So you, you could teach him a lesson, but you couldn't kill him. Um, but anyway, that's another thing for another show. Uh, Kevin Williamson, he was watching a documentary, an A&E style crime documentary at a house he was house-sitting for in Palm Springs uh, one night. And the documentary was on the Gainesville Ripper, a true story, a serial killer who attacked the University of Florida, a man named Danny Rowling. Now, Danny Rowling was a Louisiana native. And in August of 1990, over the course of four days, Danny Rowling murdered four co-eds, uh, three girls and a man by breaking into their apartments and pretty savagely butchering them with knives. There was one victim who I believe was a dispatcher for the local police. He killed her, uh, positioned her on the side of the bed after cutting off her head and then rolling put the severed head on a chest of drawers so that the head looked like it was looking at the body. So this was meant to terrify anyone who walked into the room with the extra sadistic touch of having the, dis, the, the disembodied head staring at its own body. So he was a crazy motherfucker, Danny Rowling. Uh, he was eventually captured in Ocala, uh, Ocala, Florida. He later confessed to the murder of a family of three that had happened earlier in the year. Uh, now, Danny is gone. Danny Rowling was executed by lethal injection in 2006, long after the Scream movies were made. But this was the subject of the documentary Kevin Williamson was watching that night as he house sat. And so he was already a little freaked out. He went around the house and he found a window open in the house that he did not remember being open. So Williamson got even more terrified. I guess he thought Danny Rowling might be in the house. And so he grabbed the telephone and he called up a friend of his and grabbed the knife out of the kitchen. And with the telephone to one ear and the knife in his hand, Williamson walked around the house, checking all the closets under the beds, uh, trying to see if there was an intruder, an intruder in the house. And as they did this, he and his friend were kind of going over movie trivia with each other as a way of kind of taking his mind off of things. Well, this sparked something in Williamson's mind. And this is where he first got the idea about doing a film in which you could incorporate movie trivia, uh, a serial killer, a home invasion, a person walking around with a knife in one hand and a phone in the other. And this became the uh, impetus for a treatment that he wrote called Scary Movie, because that's what Scream's original title was, Scary Movie. Later, the company that bought 
the script, took the title and used it for a different <laughs> project altogether, uh, Dimension Films did. But for the longest time, even as they were filming, it was known as Scary Movie. So after making this treatment, uh, Williamson uh, holed up in an apartment um, that he had for three days, didn't come out, and started writing. And in the course of three days, he wrote the first draft of the script that would become the film Scream. Just wrote it really quickly. Just He had the idea in his mind, and he just went for it. And so he wrote that, and then he also wrote two outlines, two five-page outlines for potential sequels. Because Williamson saw this as maybe like a horror trilogy. He called it, it could be like, in his mind, the, the uh, Star Wars equivalent in horror was his idea. And so by June, he had the script to his agent. His agent thought it was too violent for Hollywood because it had very brutal <clears throat> depictions of murder in it. I mean, there's one instance where a guy is split open and his guts are pulled out. Um, there's women's heads getting crushed in, uh, in um, uh, garage doors. Uh, there's slit throats, all kinds of stuff, lots of shooting. So the guy, his agent was kind of like, I don't know if we can sell this in the modern climate of Hollywood, uh, being around 1995. It was like, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. So they put it on the market. And immediately there was a bidding war over the script. Um, but it would have hated to see Rambo 6. Yes, absolutely. But the thing about this, and I guess we'll talk about this also when we get into the making of the film and the, and the problems they had with the ratings board, it's really amazing how much things have changed between then and now. Because there were, even in 1995, there was so much shit you couldn't get away with in an R-rated movie. And we'll go over some of the examples uh, in, in Scream, I guess, here shortly. Uh, but with the bidding war, it came down to two buyers. And I think one of these buyers was, or potential buyers, was slightly surprising. Oliver Stone actually offered quite a bit of money for this script. So think about that. Scream directed by Oliver Stone. Kind of an odd choice. It would have uh, been better. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I, I must say, Ryan, that I am a big fan of Scream. Um, I think this is where you and I differ. So we might have another one of those theoretical six-minute fights in the alley that we were talking about on our uh, They Live show. Um, but anyway, the other bu potential buyer was Dimension Films, which was owned by the Weinstein brothers. It was a subsidiary of, of Miramax. Bob Weinstein, the one that's not skeezy, uh, ran Allegedly. Dimension. <laughs> ran Dimension while... Well, while Harvey, his skeezier brother, ran Miramax. Um, so Williamson took the $400,000 offered from Dimension, mainly because they were also interested in buying the two treatments for sequels that he had prepared. So he basically sold a script and two treatments. Um, Bob Weinstein approached Wes Craven to direct this movie early on. Uh, Wes Craven, famous for having written and directed classics like uh, The Hills Have Eyes, A Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, The Last House on the Left, People Under the Stairs, Shocker. So he obviously already very well known and established within the genre. Wes Craven read the script for Scream, even though it was called Scary Movie, we'll call it Scream. Uh, and he was like, you know, this is... I like the script. I think it's scary, but it's too much like my earlier stuff. Because at this point, Wes Craven was trying to move out of hardcore horror. He had started doing movies like uh, Vampire in Brooklyn. You know, he, he wanted to see if he could branch out. But the one thing about Wes is like the last couple movies he, he did, Vampire in Brooklyn and Wes Craven's New Nightmare, which I love, neither were successful. Um... So he was kind of in a weird spot in his career. He needed a hit. And he thought that hit was going to come with his adaptation of The Haunting of Hill House, which is what he was working on, a film that would later be made as The Haunting by Jan de Bont, a really terrible adaptation of The Haunting of Hill House by Jan de Bont. Um, but The Haunting, for him at least, fell apart. So he, after that job was lost... Uh, you know, Bob Weinstein offered him again the chance to direct Scream, 
and he took it this time. Because he was like, well, I guess I'm available. And I did like the script, but I don't know. I don't know about all this hardcore horror stuff. But anyway, he decided he would just do, he, to prove to his fans that he hadn't softened up or, you know, whatever, he was going to go one more time and do a, a real, uh, you know, balls-to-the-wall horror movie. Uh, Williamson told a story about how he met Wes Craven in the lobby of Miramax and was just <clears> amazed. <throat> You know, he said, wow, that's Wes Craven. Because, you know, Williamson's a big fan of horror, as is evidenced through the movie. And, um, you know, he was like, can you introduce me? And so the producer took, up, took him over and introduced him to Wes Craven. And Williamson said that Craven told him, you know, I really liked your script. It was really scary. And Williamson said that at that moment, he thought he could just lay down and die. Because Wes Craven said his, his script was scary. But luckily he didn't. And they went on to, uh, to make the movie. Now, I'm going to go around this room. Zach Myers, have you ever heard of an actress named Drew Barrymore? Yes, I have. I'm a big uh, Firestarter fan. He's looking at me like, what do you think, I'm an idiot, LC? Of course I know Drew Barrymore. I love Firestarter and her immortal classic, Never Been Kissed. Yes, yeah, in Cat's Eye. Oh, Cat's Eye, yeah. And we can't forget about E.T., the extraterrestrial. Oh, yes. And Poison Ivy. I tried to Ivy. forget about that. <laughs> oh, not, not an E.T. Um, fan. Go ahead, Rebecca. Oh, I was going to say Doppelganger. Was, she was in that one, right? <laughs> you know, I don't even I don't remember. I don't know that I saw that one. I, I do remember Poison Ivy, though. But it's, it's worth noting at this point to say that Drew Barrymore had kind of pushed her way through the Poison Ivy phase of her career and the child actor phase of her career and had come back big time by 1995. She was on the rise yet again as an adult actress. And so they came to her for the role of, of Sidney Prescott, the star of Scream. And Drew Barrymore was really interested in playing and starring in this movie, uh, Scream, and playing Sidney. But she had some other obligations that kind of prevented her from taking such a large role. And that's when the idea came to the Weinsteins and to Wes Craven that, hey, why don't we do this? Why don't we have Drew Barrymore play the Casey Becker character? Casey Becker dies in the first 10 minutes of Scream. And they were like, you know, we got this big star. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if, if we start the movie and everybody thinks, oh, she's going to be the, the lead character? And then 10 minutes later... She's gutted and hung from a tree. Nobody will know where we're going from here. And apparently everybody thought that was a great idea. And that's how Drew Barrymore wound up being the opening scene victim in, um, in Scream, one of the first people to die. And this opened up, obviously, the opportunity for Nev Campbell to, to star as Sidney Prescott. Now, Rebecca, I happen to know that you're a huge Party of Five fan. No. <laughs> um, no. but that's what she was really that's the only thing she was known for Ryan have you ever heard of a movie called The Craft yes you remember it that on, it was I'll tell you why I remember it because in 8th grade I had this cheater box and like we got every pay-per-view all the time forever so it was on like 97 times a day you know over the course of four different channels or else that wouldn't be possible but yeah I remember and it. That that movie was came out the same year as Scream. It was a few months before, um, and it had a lot of the same cast members, like Skeet Ulrich, who played Billy Loomis in Scream, was also in The Craft. Uh, obviously, Nev Campbell. Uh, go ahead, Rebecca. You're gonna say something. Oh, I was just gonna say Nev Campbell. I remembered her from uh, the Canterville Ghosts with Patrick Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, yes. I mean, a movie that only little, you watched. <laughs> that's right. Only I watched on the Hallmark Channel, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that um, Sinbad movie was on at that time too. That one people say he didn't do. Oh yeah, I know the one you're talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I love how I'm like, oh, Canterville Ghost. That should Bill existed. Campbell. Yeah. Drew Drew Barrymore for Doppelganger. <laughs> yes, movies that no one has ever heard of. Uh, it would be like, you know, from the craft, Feruza Balk. Oh, yeah, from the worst witch. Yeah, so yeah, I would bring that one up because I like that movie. <laughs> yeah. um, but Reese Witherspoon was also considered for uh, Sidney Prescott. David Arquette, one of the many Arquettes, you know, there's Why Rosanna. Why does he get an Oscar? Who, David Arquette? Yeah. 
Yeah, he's your favorite character in the movie. He's your favorite character in this movie. I know that, Ryan. As Deputy Dewey Riley. Um, Deputy Dewey. <laughs> Deputy Dewey, who was written in the script as like a good-looking, kind of hulky, beefy guy. And that is not that is not what David Arquette was. Um, but David Arquette auditioned with kind of a goofy version of the character. And Wes Craven apparently liked that approach. So um, good thing for David Arquette, because I had never heard of David Arquette before I saw Scream. And because the cast are listed in alphabetical order, he got top billing on all the Scream movies, even ahead of Nev Campbell, believe it or not. So it kind of worked out in his favor because, like I said, never would have known him, uh, you know, because I knew, obviously, did, Patricia and Rosanna. Did yeah, he ahead. do Ready to Rumble before or after that? He did, he did a after. movie after? Okay. Yeah, because, yeah, like everything David Arquette did that anybody saw was after Scream. Because I don't, yeah. I'm sure he had been in stuff before, well, see, but it he, was not. He and Drew Barrymore would be in Never Been Kissed, the one you brought up earlier. <laughs> Maybe That's true. Like the brother. That's true. Very true. Um, there were actually quite a few people in this cast that worked. Because that's the thing about Scream and also Scream 2. The casting was really well orchestrated. And so much as every like hot actor who was just about to break out seemed to be cast in either Scream or Scream 2. Um, this was not necessarily the case with Scream 3, uh, which was... One of my criticisms we'll get to when that film finally arrives. But like people like Matthew Lillard and Rose McGowan, Crazy Rose McGowan, uh, Jamie Kennedy, uh, all of these people were just about to break out. In fact, Jamie Kennedy's first role was in Scream. And of course, he played Randy, who was one of the fan favorite characters. Um, now, filming took place for this movie over the course of eight weeks in April of 1996 in Southern California. Um, Zach, I don't know if you know this, but there was a lot of controversy about the location scouting for this movie. Have you heard this story? No, I haven't. Santa Rosa High School refused to let filming take place inside the premises after they read this script. And they were like, the principal gets murdered, and what happens, and who's disemboweled? And they were like, hell no, you're not filming in our school. A uh, huge petition against this movie. Eventually, they actually used the community center in Santa Rosa as the high school, which oh. it kind of it kind of works. It looks like a high school. I never really uh, doubted it. Um, but interestingly enough, Wes Craven. Why wouldn't you just go to a different high school? It's not like they're you know. I don't know. A million uh, miles I, apart. I guess they just decided they liked the look of the Santa Rosa Community Center more than uh, some of the other high schools. Uh, and it does look like a high school. Like, to me, I don't think it doesn't look any different than any high school I've ever seen, you know. So I, I guess they just like the look of it. They like the little square area where they all sit outside by the fountain for the scene where you get to know all the, the teenage characters. Um, it's, it's weird to say, though, that Wes Craven was almost fired from this movie. Um, that's kind of crazy to think in hindsight, but Bob Weinstein did not like the look of the, of the killer's outfit and the mask. Um, again, strange to say, because it is so... It's the well entire known. marketing card campaign, but okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, when they were filming the movie, he, the producers did not like that. They said, this thing is silly looking. It's not scary. I don't buy it. And so what Craven did was he cut together 13 minutes, like a test reel of some of the scenes they've done with ghost faced in action. And after that, Bob Weinstein, seeing it within the context of the scenes, was like, oh, OK, I get it now. Fine, you can keep it. But for a while there, he, he did not like the ghost face outfit at all. Um, another thing to mention that the DP on this movie is Mark Irwin. Mark Irwin has worked many, many years with many, many directors and is a great DP. But he and his crew made a little bit of a mistake, a mistake which actually got Mark Irwin fired. I was saying Wes Craven almost got fired. Well, Mark Irwin did get fired. Uh, you know the final scenes in this movie where the killers are revealed. They shot all of that. But here's the problem. When they looked at the footage, it was all out of focus. Which, big, big problem. A lot of money spent, performances spent, 
um, you know, the whole thing had to be reshot. And I wasn't that caught in the moment. I have no idea. That's a great question. That's a great question. Like and, now, now, I mean, obviously technology, you know, improves everything, but now we can, we see it instantly. But you think that, that type of, why wouldn't you even test part of it? I don't know. It just seems lazy. Or maybe it's amazing. Were, what did they catch it in dailies or? Yes, they caught it in dailies. Like the next day when they were watching the footage from the day before, it was like, wait a second, is this a little fuzzy? This looks soft to me. And sure enough, a lot of it was unusable. I mean, it was so soft that you couldn't project that in major movie theaters. People would have noticed. And so Mark Irwin, even though he was a very, very seasoned uh, director of photography, uh, this did not help him at all with the Weinsteins. Uh, Bob Weinstein was like, what's this money spent and we got fucking blurry footage? Fire him! And that's what happened. Um, straight up fired Mark Irwin two weeks from the completion of shooting. This was not on the first day. Mark Irwin shot the whole fucking movie practically. And so the last two weeks, a guy named Peter Deming, who would return for all subsequent sequels, was brought in to, to finish the cinematography. On That's kind of messed up. What, did he got I mean, fired? People, people make mistakes, you know what I mean? It, it like, I was the first guy to say, how could you do this? But at the same token, you know, he's got years of you know, quality experience under his belt. Maybe he just fucked up. What do you think, Zach? Would you have fired Mark Irwin? Fuck yeah. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, I have to, I have to maybe go, I have to go with Ryan on this one because like, you know, people do make mistakes, you know, but you know, maybe there was a reason for everything because the movie ended up being, you know, badass anyway. So yes, that's true. I do really like the cinematography on the first screen. I think some of those shots, the Dutch angles on some of the murder scenes, I remember particularly like when Rose McGowan's in the garage and the first time she sees Ghostface and the camera's at a tilt, you know, and all that kind of uh, little subtle things, I thought, Mark Irwin did beautifully. Uh, and, of course, yeah. some of that may have been Wes Craven, in all fairness, too. I would have just said, we got two weeks left. Let's just ride it out. Just reshoot it. Ride it out. Two weeks left, and we're not bringing them back for the sequel. And what I was a little bit, uh, what, what I think happened, too, was I think what, the producers said at first was we got to get rid of whoever caused that uh, soft footage in term of like the focus puller. But Mark Irwin brought his own people on and I think he took the fall for his people. He was like, if you fire them, then I have to go. And so then they were like, okay, you going. Bye. You know? yeah. Oh no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was one of those ultimatums that did not work in, in Mark Irwin's favor. Now, um, as I said before, the title was changed around this time as they were wrapping up production to Scream. Uh, neither Wes Craven nor Kevin Williamson liked the title Scream. They, they thought their original title was much better. In hindsight, I, don't, I can't imagine this movie being called Scary Movie. Yeah. It doesn't fit. And I'm not even talking about the movie that they made that became Scary Movie. You know, I, just if you look at this movie, I just don't see this being called Scary Movie. I think Scream is the right title. Um, now, there were a couple additions to the script that, that Bob Weinstein uh, insisted upon. He read the script and he said, 30 pages of this script. We got a bunch of people talking. Nobody dies. You like my <laughs> Bob Weinstein impersonation? Mm -hmm. um, he says, nobody dies. So we got to fix that. There's got to be a death in here. Kill somebody. Fuck it. And so, um, <laughs> and so Kevin Williamson was like, oh, OK, um, let me see. We could kill maybe the principal. And they were like, yeah, I never liked Henry Winkler anyway. Kill him. <laughs> um, poor Fonzie. But, yeah, poor Fonzie took a took a bullet and all because of Bob Weinstein. Bob Weinstein was like, kill Fonzie. Fuck it. And so he wound up. Jew on Jew violence. <laughs> yeah, uh, but it, ultimately it turned out okay because it solved a problem in the script later on. Because in the final scene, there are a lot of, I should say the final sequence, there are a lot of other kids at the party. And they were always wondering, like, how do we get these kids out of there? Because we got to, like, clear the 
decks other than for all the main characters. We got to get all these ancillary extras out of the party. And so when the suggestion came to kill the principal, Williamson was like, okay, well, hang on. If I put the principal's death in there, well, that will give us an excuse to get rid of the other kids at the party. Because if you remember the movie, what happens is uh, Randy gets a call that says, Principal Humbry has just been found uh, gutted and hanging from the goalpost on the football field. And then all the kids are like, oh, let's go before they tear him down. And they all jump in their car and race off to go see the dead body. Uh, so that's how they solved that problem, was with, the, with Fonzie's body hanging from the goalpost, which you never see, but you hear about. Um, and, and they all leave. Now, like I was saying before, the MPAA had a lot of problems with this movie. It was a different day back in 1995. Wes Craven always had problems with the MPAA throughout his career. I don't think they liked him very much. Um, some of the things that they did not like about the first cut of Scream was at the beginning of the movie, the Drew Barrymore's boyfriend, when you see him in the original cut, um, she turns on the light and he's gutted and his intestines are actually spilling out of his stomach cavity when you first see it. And they were like, you can't have intestines coming out. They were like, you can show him after he's gutted, but you can't show intestines rolling out. And so, you know, they, they changed it. So what you see in the movie is you see a little bit of footage right after the intestines rolled out. They're already out of his body. So the MPAA, as always, were, were throwing out things like this. We've talked about this sort of thing on earlier shows like Scarface. There was a, there was a shot where you kind of um, steady cammed in on Drew Barrymore's body after she's been killed and she's hanging from a tree and all of her insides have been ripped out. Originally, that was a much slower steady cam in. And what the MPAA said is if you want the NC-17 and you want to keep that shot in the movie, you're going to have to speed that shit up. So in the final film, what you see is a sped up version of running straight toward her and then it gets right on her face and it disappears. I guess the idea is, well, maybe they won't be able to look and linger on all the gross shit that's around, you know, hanging out of her body and everything, you know. Um, so there was that. There was um, weird things like... The um, videographer, Gail Weathers, is a videographer, um, who is played, by the way, by Courtney Cox, hot off of Friends fame. Uh, the videographer's face when he gets his throat cut, the MPAA says, you can't show his face like that. He looks like he's in distress. And you go, well, of course he's in distress. His fucking throat's getting cut. Um it was just weird stuff. So they had to cut around these strange things. Like you can imagine nowadays, none of this would be a problem. Uh, another thing was the amount of times that Billy Loomis and Stu stab each other at the end of the movie. Because you remember in the final scene, uh, they want to make it look like they're victims rather than being the killers. And so they stab each other up a little bit. Well, they were like, you can't show them being stabbed. And this led to some really weird cuts in the movie. This is some criticism I'll give the film. And it's, I'm not saying it was anyone's fault because I, they, they were made to do this. But like in those scenes, there are some really odd cutaways to like Nev Campbell's face and you just hear slashing going on off screen. And it's a little odd, like it feels a little odd. Um, but at the same time, that was their solution of getting around actually seeing knives going into Skeet Ulrich and Matthew Lillard. Um, so, let's talk for a second. Let's go around the room, a little round table, about your overall, your um, opinions about the first Scream movie. Mm -hmm. Zach, what do you think of the film as a whole, sir? I love it. It's one of my favorite horror films. Yes. Beck? Um, it was insanely popular when it came out i remember see i i'm kind of was a you know i was, I was in that the age group they were focusing on um at the time i got kind of tired of people at school talking about it so when i saw it i was just kind of you know it wasn't fresh when i got finally got to see it yeah. but yeah it's you know it's it's kind of fun to watch it and kind of like a nostalgia type thing 
Yeah, but, at the, but, at, but at the time, but at the time, I remember just being, will you people shut up about Because all my schoolmates wouldn't shut up about it. So when you saw it, they kind of ruined it for you. Did that they tell you the sense. ending? Did they tell you who the killers were? Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, that's so, not, that's so, so I didn't, you know, so I didn't get to have that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, uh, Ryan, this the hold on to your potatoes, Dr. Jones. What did you think? I mean, it wasn't that bad for 1995. No. But, uh, but I, I just never took it that seriously. Like, I almost took it like, you know how a scary movie, you know, mimicked it? I kind of took it like that in the first place. <laughs> like, I kind of so watched this. I kind of well, watched it as the comedy almost the whole time. Like, I never took that, like, it's just little bits and pieces of it throughout the first couple of them where a lot of the story just didn't make a lot of sense to me. Like, and, and then just the, the I don't know, it, like, a part, I, was it the second one where, like, they have her engulfed in a play where, like, where the yeah. theme of the play is stabbing her? Like, shouldn't she, like, not be worried about this? This is... Why would you do this to any girl? Like, I can't imagine a girl in high school who made national headlines for, you know, having this problem. And all of a sudden, yeah, let's put her in the school play in a theme of, of, of just being surrounded by knives. This, uh, you know, so a lot of it just wasn't thought out to me. But it wasn't you. bad. For, it wasn't, it wasn't, I don't know. I never took it seriously, I guess. I never, it, I, I got to give them credit. They made a lot of money, like, like Rebecca said. They did very well. Well, let's talk about how much money they made. Uh, this movie was made on a $15 million budget. It opened in December of 1996, and it climbed the charts very quickly, mainly but from word of mouth. People were going home, and they were telling other people, you got to go see this movie, Scream. This is so weird, and uh, it's so different. You'll love it. And so uh, they kept going back to see it again and again and then bringing friends. And then those friends would bring other friends. That's how this movie made $87 million in its first run. Now, that may not seem like much by today's standards, but you have to remember in 1995, the horror genre was made up of direct-to-video, straight. You did not go to the theater to see it. It's the a horror genre. It was over. Like, the horror genre was over. Uh, in terms of big theatrical releases. And this was the first movie prior to things like Blair Witch that really made horror a bankable genre again. Like, people and, were like, wait, what? You made how much on this? And Go ahead, Beth. I was going to say, and also, um, you, what you were talking about it being kind of funny was it did, it did kind of come off a little bit because they were aware of, you know, horror yes. movie elements that they kind of... And I will say, the first time I saw this, this was one of the first movies that actually mentioned real movies. Yeah. You know, like, I, before this, they would always make up some movie that didn't really exist. But when I first watched this, and they were starting to talk about, like, there's a joke in the first ten minutes of the movie about how Nightmare on Elm Street is, the first one's better than all the other ones, and you're like, <laughs> oh, the guy that directed this is the director of the first Nightmare yeah. on Elm Street. So they're, like, making jokes about the... The, the director of this movie and something he did and kind of poking fun at the, the series that he had sort of uh, uh, disregarded or disowned. So it was stuff like that that made me sit up straight and go like, wow, wait a second. They're referencing stuff that I know about. Yeah. And I had never seen a movie that did that before. I mean, it's kind of normal now, but back then, you know, it was so different. And it was also what Ryan was saying is that there was a lot of humor in the movie. The characters were funny. You know, they were smart, and they were making jokes about each other, and they weren't really, like, stupid teenagers. I was going to make a bad joke. Was like, well, except for Sleepless in Seattle. Remember, What's they, kept, they kept joking about um, an affair to remember. That was the whole premise of the movie. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. What happened with Williamson after the success of this movie is that every script he ever had any involvement with was greenlit. I know what you did last summer, which was an adaptation of a Lois Duncan book, uh, a pilot for a TV show called Dawson's Creek, which became an enormous success, mainly because of how much Rebecca viewed it. Um, <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> my sister um, watched that show, and I was just always wanted to just put my head behind the back wheel of my dad's truck and just have him back over me. Now, I will say that <laughs> 
Uh, Dawson's Creek, I think the first season, which was like five or six episodes, I, I didn't mind the first season so much. But after that, it, that show became really tedious, really quick. Was, going, yeah, very tedious. We have to keep this going because people are watching and we're making money. Yeah, and it went... And keep, it got it, keep, really, keep the train moving at any, any cost, Dawson. And it, Dawson got really boring. I was never a big fan of the Dawson character. I thought he was a whiny little bitch. But some of the other characters, just they got really boring in, in how they interacted with each other. And I'm like, I don't really care who's screwing who in this show anymore. It's a little too teenage -y for me. But that first season I thought was okay. Uh, but anyway, that's just some examples of Williamson's success after Scream. He was the hot screenwriter. In fact, that script I was telling you before that he wrote inspired by the mean teacher uh, killing Mrs. Tingle was eventually directed by him. Uh, so he got to make that script. Uh, he got to bring that script to life himself. I'm not a huge fan of the film, Teaching Mrs. Tingle, but I just think it was kind of cool that he got to bring to life his first, um, his first ever screenplay. Now, was it, Zach was it Myers. In that too? Yeah, she was, from Dawson's, from Dawson's Week. Joey, uh, Tom Cruise's future uh, uh, wife, I guess. Zach Myers. You ever heard of a movie called Scream 2? <laughs> I'm asking you like... The fuck I'm is that? Asking, I'm just asking like the stupidest questions you ever ask anybody on a show based about, around Scream today. Uh, so, because you had no idea I was coming at, at you with that question, did you? No, no, no. But uh, I liked it. No, you did. You liked Scream 2? Well, I like Scream 2, too. Scream 2, 2, 2, 2. And did, uh, <laughs> That's what they should have called the sequels after Scream 2. Scream 2. Yeah. That's right. Scream 2. You're they, still screaming. Yes. But I will say, I will say though, who who the fuck's that guy in the movie that like gets on the table and like sings? Jerry O'Connell. Yeah. yeah. I fucking hate that guy. Yeah. If they would have just not put him in the movie, it would have been 10 times better. My but, secret identity. <laughs> Yes, and he was also the fat boy in Stand By Me. Remember yeah, I didn't like him. Then. I didn't like him then either. Yeah, everything he's in. Yeah, see, I Ryan just always think oh, I, I do actually. We're on the same wavelength on that one. Every uh. time I see him, I hear the theme song to My Secret Identity. That's and that scientist guy and him flying around. And he Is, also, isn't he a twin? No, he's not. I don't know if that's his twin brother, but he did have a brother who, who was in some movies around the same time in the 90s as Scream. But he, had, but he has like an identical twin, doesn't he? His brother is not identical. No, they look similar. Uh. But he, I, I don't. The brother, I just remembered um, Jerry O'Connell is his name, and he was in that TV show Sliders. I don't yes. know if you remember Sliders. that. And then he left the show, and then his brother took over, like as the lead of the show, that much I do remember. But anyway, yes, he was cast in Scream 2. Scream 2 was fast-tracked after Scream 1. And I, when I say fast-tracked... can't imagine I why. Mean, I, yeah, right? Well, they realize you can make a shit ton of money with, for very little. Because it came out like a year later, right? It actually came out a few days less than a year later. Oh, crap. Um, they had a six-month production... Saw-level precision. Exactly. Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, they had a six-month production schedule on Scream 2, uh, which was, it had some alternate titles, not Scream 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, but they did think about uh, Scream Again, Scream Louder, Scream the sequel. Luckily, they didn't use any of those titles. Um, but th there was instantly problems, because this was in the time of the Internet, when, you know, I guess a little bit long before the NDA problems that we have nowadays, where everyone has to sign away, you know, um, uh, their soul when they get a script. This was, in a way, sort of the beginning of that, at least within the horror genre, because instantly when the studio got the first script for Scream 2, the Internet got it as well. It leaked onto the Internet, and it was pretty much everything. Uh, it, it gave away who the killers were going to be. It gave away basically the setting, the basic plot. So instantaneously, they went into rewrite mode. But when you have a six-month production schedule, uh, you don't have a lot of time to rewrite beforehand. So they were rewriting. Williamson was rewriting as they were casting, as they were shooting. Um, Basically, the movie was being written all the way through production uh, to recover from the fact that the first draft revealed everything. So instantly, you had to change who the killers were. 
you had to change their motives, you had to come up with something new. Um, now, the thing about the shooting of this movie, it was done in Los Angeles and in Atlanta, at a, at a girls' college in Atlanta, because Scream 2 is set a few years after Scream. The characters are now going to a fictional place called Windsor College. Um, you had a lot of... Everyone who survived the first one, pretty much, at least in terms of the principal cast, uh, Nev Campbell as Sydney, Jamie Kennedy as Randy, David Arquette, Dewey, um, and... Uh, Courtney Cox as Gail, Liev Schreiber as Cotton Weary. They all returned. But you had a... a, a but we had a slew. We had a slew. Apparently Ryan has lost you, Rebecca. But I haven't. I can see you. Um, I'm by screen. Gone. Well, we're, we're slowly being axed one at a time by Ghostface. That's right. That's right. Uh, a, a, whole <clears throat> new, a whole new slew of cast came in. Sarah Michelle Geller, Buffy herself. I can I'm just waiting for Rebecca's eyes to roll because I know she had to deal with Buffy for many, many years. That was another favorite of her sisters. Um, <laughs> Elise Neal, uh, Zach's favorite actor, That's Jerry O'Connor. Uh Laurie Metcalf from Roseanne, nine years off of Roseanne, she appeared in this movie. Timothy Oliphantastic, otherwise known as Tim Timothy Oliphant. Uh, hey, that made me happy. I like him. You like Timothy Oliphant? Yeah. You a big Justin Hyde fan? Totally. Is that how the fuck you say his last name? Yes, Timothy Oliphant. Yes. Man, I wasn't even close all these years. Or if, or if, uh, or if you're a friend of his, Tim Timothy Oliphantastic is his nickname. Um, but anyway, they were kind of the hot ticket cast in town. You know, like everybody was trying to get into Scream Two after Scream One. Uh, the budget was increased just a little bit from 15 to 24 million dollars and again you had the opening scene this was already a trademark in the first 10 minutes of these movies you had to kill somebody famous and kill them brutally and so this time around uh they decided to shoot the opening scene at the famous rialto theater in pasadena california and the opening victims were jada pinkett before she married will smith and omar epps um they're going to an early screening of a movie called stab Again, really clever idea, because I would never have necessarily thought of this. So the movie that comes out in Scream 2 is a movie that's based on the events of Scream 1, only it's called Stab. So in Scream 2, you see scenes from this movie based on the events of the first, but they're all mixed up. Like, you can tell that they tried to make it look like the screenwriter got the details wrong, you know? And they even paid off a joke from the first screen where uh, someone is asking uh, Nev Campbell's character, Sydney, who would play you in a movie? And she like goes, oh, God, all my luck would be Tori Spelling. And then in Scream 2, you find out that the star of Stab is Tori Spelling. You know? So they were paying off jokes from part one and part two, which I thought was really clever. Uh, Robert Rodriguez. Say that again, Ryan. That part's good. Yes, Robert Rodriguez. Uh, that part's good. He directed the scenes uh, with of the movie within the movie, the the stab scenes, like when they recreated the opening. Oh, that, very more. That makes a lot more sense why it's good. Yes, <laughs> Robert Rodriguez directed the like all the stab stuff, the stuff where you see like Heather Graham playing the Drew Barrymore character. All that was Robert Rodriguez. That's because um, in the fictional world of that film and stuff, all those stab movies are supposed to be directed by Robert Rodriguez and stuff like that. Cause they show his name in the theater and stuff. And it's, I always loved that. Yes, yes. Because what you find out in part two is that Gail Weathers, uh, the reporter from one, um, has written a book called The Woodsboro Murders based on the events of the first film. And then that's been turned into this movie, Stab which as the Scream series goes on, you discover they made a lot of stabs. They made a lot of stab sequels. Um, but anyway, again, there were all kinds of MPAA type issues, but they started thinking of that beforehand on, on Scream 2. And what Wes Craven's uh, solution was ultimately was, hey, I know what we can do this time. Let's film the scenes with way more gore. And that way, when they make us cut things, we can say, oh, okay, we can cut this because we didn't intend it to be that gory to begin with. 
And so it was sort of an around the barn to get to the door type way of avoiding an NC-17 hassle on the sequel. Uh, surprisingly, the MPAA did not request a lot of cuts in this in Scream 2, uh, mainly because when they watched the movie, they thought they said that it thematically they understood what the movie was saying more. And so they thought that the violence shown was more justified than in the first film. So ironically enough, they shot all this extra gore thinking they were going to have to cut it. And they didn't really have to cut it unless they wanted to in Scream 2, which was an unusual sort of predicament. Ryan, what is your favorite part of Scream 2? The like, end. The end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Zach, you're the person I should have asked this question. What is your favorite part of Scream 2? Um, I love it when, uh, when Buffy gets hopped over the balcony. Somehow I knew you were going to say that. I knew that. Yeah, yeah. That's a good one. That's no, a good... I probably would have used that if I could remember a lot of it. It's been a long time since I've seen these. Yeah, Buffy straight up gets stabbed. Sarah Michelle Gellar, I remember her saying that she was so used to on Buffy that have doing all the kung fu and the fighting that when they were shooting this, she was like, well, can I at least like throw a punch or a kick or something? And they were like, no, you're not playing Buffy. This, <laughs> no. this girl doesn't fight back. No, stop it. Um, now, I'm going to be, there are some things about Scream 2, and I think, even though I, I really like it, I like it as much as Scream 1, and some people would argue that. Some people say it's not as good as Scream Part 1. Um, now, that said, I can point out a couple things about Scream 2 that I could maybe criticize a bit. One of them, I think, it was just a problem from the fact that they were re rewriting and writing as they were going. There are certain elements, such as the scene where they're, they're standing in front of a chalkboard, and they're tying the names of the new victims to names of previous victims. They're like, well, this girl's name's Maureen. Like, Sydney's mother was named Maureen. And this guy's name is Stephen. Just like the guy that was gutted was named was Stephen. And so you're like, oh, okay. So there's some sort of pattern going on. Fine. And then after that scene, you never hear about that again. <laughs> it's like... It's like, okay, so we're connecting the names and that's important, but then other people start to get killed that don't have any connection name-wise or, or in any other way to the previous victims. And so what was the name thing? You know, it's just sort of an odd scene that doesn't mm -hmm. go anywhere. Uh, maybe I think it's it, part of the predicament of having to rewrite it so much. You, it's just, you're trying to make everything make sense over the course of a couple hours and you're trying to do it in, you know, warp speed time. You're going to, it's just not going to, that's not how you should make movies. No, right. I mean, maybe they just should have just said, forget it. If they want to ruin the ending for themselves, mm -hmm. let them ruin it, because we want to make a good film that it from 15 years from now, somebody will watch and go, it's a decent film instead of what the hell happened. It does kind of feel like this. this it does. <laughs> it does feel like the thing where, um, you know, maybe that was a big deal in the earlier script and mm -hmm. they were trying to figure out how do we work it into the new script? And they just sort of ran out of time, you know. Um, now, there were other things. I think that the twist of who at least one of the killers is at the end, I don't think it's all that surprising. I remember sitting in the theater, and when Timothy Oliphant was revealed as the killer, I was like, well, of course it's Mickey. Where the fuck's he been this whole time? Because <laughs> he's in, like, two scenes in the movie, you know? I know. I mean, I think one of the brilliant things about the mystery in the first film is, is that, number one, you don't know there's two killers. Yeah. And so you have scenes where one guy is there and the other guy is there. And so you're assuming that one person is doing this. And so if you watch the movie, it's like, well, it couldn't be Billy because he's here when the killer. And it can't be him because he was there when the killer. And so you go, oh, well, who could the fucking, who's the killer in this thing? And then, of course, it, you reveal at the end, there's two of them, and they're kind of trading off the costume. And you go, oh, well, that's why, you know. So I thought, I thought that the, the, killer, who, the killer's identities in the first one were very, it was, it was neatly kept secret, uh, cleverly kept secret. Uh, like I said, in this one, yeah, I, I was not shocked that Timothy Oliphant was the killer. 
I was yeah. just like, yeah, okay. Well, I mean, yeah, he's never around, so I guess it. it but you makes can't. Sense. But you can't tell me to find out the second killer was Roseanne's sister didn't blow your mind. Now that's the one I, I will definitely give because that I thought was a really clever twist, and Laurie Metcalf, she got a lot of praise for this performance she gives as the deranged mother of Billy Loomis because people weren't used to seeing Laurie Metcalf like chasing people around with knives and going full deranged going in the full deranged mode trying to kill Nev Campbell it was like whoa wow what's she doing uh, Roseanne's sister's gone nuts um, and she plays it extremely well uh, I also I thought, thought it was that, one of the highlights yes yes she does a great job as, as Billy's mother, which is funny because we never learn what is her first name was. You know, she, she in, this, in the movie, she goes by the alias Debbie Salt, but you discover her real name is, is Mrs. Loomis. You never know what her first name She's Billy's mother or Mrs. Loomis. Um, but anyway, I thought that, yes, you're right, Zach. That was a very good twist. Um, and that I did not see coming. Uh, I think uh, Mickey says in the movie, you didn't see that one coming, did you? I was like, no, didn't see that one coming. Um, the Do you know who the original killers were meant to be, Zach? Mm -mm. No, I don't. In the original leak script, the killers were Derek, who is your favorite character, played by Jerry O'Connell, and uh, Holly, Holly, her roommate. Man, I would have walked the fuck out. I would have been <laughs> so pissed. <laughs> yes, those were the original killers in the leak script. Uh, you find out that Sydney's They should have had him in Scream 3 getting letters from I Zach. Mean, then, then you just go, girl, you need to stop dating, because you keep dating people that are... Right? Sydney does not have good taste in men, that's for sure. <laughs> um, yes, she can, if she can find deranged men. But you come to find out in the final version of the movie, Derek is a good lad. He's an all right boy. He wanted to save her, but he couldn't because he was tied to a giant star. And so Olive Fantastic shot him right through the heart. Um, but, uh, but no, yeah, that was the original ending. Uh, that Sydney's boyfriend and roommate were macking behind the scenes. And they were crazy. And they were going after the, the, all their friends and killing them. I think ultimately they made the right decision with the, with the new killers. Even though, like I said, one of them was not all that shocking. Uh, Marco Bellatrami, I think that's how you pronounce his last name, was the composer of Scream 1 and 2. Great scores. I really think it was great scoring done there because it was not traditional horror movie scoring. It had the weird sounds and stuff, like really strange synthy sounds and, yeah, really clever music stuff. And it started his career in a lot of ways. He went on to do uh, a lot of of similar movies, you know, genre films, um, but was very, very, uh, I think it really helped his career a lot, this. Uh, they also had a very good soundtrack for both Scream 1 and 2. I own the, the soundtrack albums. And in terms of contemporary music of the 90s, a lot of good shit on those soundtracks. Um, I do remember very much liking Scream 3 was a different story. Scream 3, I bought that soundtrack and I was like, wow, the first two were great. I can't wait to hear this. The whole fucking thing was Creed. Every okay. song. It's the third one. I, I couldn't remember which one that was just full of Creed, so I wanted to burn that soundtrack. And I couldn't oh. remember which one. They should have just called it Creed 3. Yes, Creed 3. Uh, yeah, all for some reason they decided to give the entire soundtrack of Scream Three to Creed. Uh, bad choice. Uh, there's a there's a great tune, and uh, that's kind of become almost a theme of the unofficial theme of Scream the series, which was "Red Right Hand" by Nick Cave. Uh, Take a little walk to the edge of town. You know that song. Um, you like my rendition? You can, you, you can actually find the full video on his music channel. Yes, my version, my cover of it's Red Right Hand. It's just him, you just heard it right there. Yes, no instrumentation, no production needed. It's so, just I'm so damn... trumpet of L.C. Holt. That's right, I'm so damn good. 
I just do all the parts myself. It's just me. It's just like split screens, like what you're seeing right now, but in one screen, it's me going bow, 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 bow. And then in the yeah, other cause screen. Because your, your next could, could have been a musical. Absolutely. I'm pushing for the Broadway version of your next. Few people know this. But Simon keeps throwing fucking obstacles in the way. And I'm like, bro, get with the program. We got, we got to hit the great white way. It's time for Broadway, baby. No. The yeah, Book of Mormon worked. It did. It did. Yeah. What were we saying, Beck? I was going to say, you're going to bring back the uh, horror musical. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Carrie didn't make it, but by God, you're next, Will. Um, there's also a curious piece of music that's not on the soundtrack. It probably, probably is a rights thing. But they used a piece of music. Do you remember that movie with John Travolta and Christian Slater called Broken Arrow? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, um, they a used long a, time ago. They use a piece of music. I remember when I was sitting in the theater, I went to see all of these in the theater. I was sitting there watching Scream 2, and this piece of music comes on as Dewey's theme whenever you see David Arquette. And it's, uh, it's, from, it's from The Broken Arrow. Well, so, perform it for us. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can hum that. It's a, it's a Hans Zimmer composition. Uh -huh. And so I... As you know, with Hans Zimmer, it's like kind of hard. I need some help. I need some accompaniment with some of his tunes. It's like the Dark Knight tune. Yeah. It's very hard to uh, to hum the theme of the Dark Knight films. You know, I need like Ryan, you do the bass, and and Zach, you take the horns, and I'll do the melody. It's not like the Danny Elfman one, you know, where you can just hum it, like you can just go yeah. with it. Hans Zimmer, you kind of need some accompaniment with some of his stuff, you know. Uh, Inception is another example. It's like, I can't do that one-handed. But he, anyway, a Hans Zimmer piece from Broken Arrow was used as Dewey's theme, which is strangely fitting. I mean, it works well. The story I heard is that they had, that Wes Craven and the editor had stuck it in as a temp track on the um, soundtrack, or on the uh, first cut of the movie, which temp track is just where you put a piece of existing music on and you say to the composer, basically, this is kind of the feeling we have. So, you know, think about that when you're composing it. But sometimes you have a situation where they call, uh, they call it temp track love, which is where a director will fall in love with a piece of music from the temp track and be like, uh, can we just keep that? And that was the case here. They put the Hans Zimmer from Broken Arrow theme over some of Dewey's scenes and they were like, uh, that kind of works. Let's see if we can just use that, which is what they did. You know, you just, you just paid the producers of Broken Arrow for the use of the music. Um, now, <laughs> before I go into the success of the... Of so what the, all the kids are talking about. Ah, absolutely. Um, before I go into the success of the Scream 2 film, <laughs> I do want to... I do want to point out something uh, that I always thought was funny. In, in the two Scream movies, especially in the first one, there were a lot of Sharon Stone references, uh, which I'm sure was in Williamson's script. But Sharon Stone, as you might know, has a connection to Wes Craven. Are you guys aware of this? No. She, she appeared in a Wes Craven movie early in her career called Deadly Blessing. But there is actually more to that story. Because in the 80s, Wes Craven was married to a woman named Mimi. Mimi Craven. Right? Um, <laughs> Mimi, and this is going to get kind of weird, but I'm just going to point this out since there, it does relate to Scream and, and all the Sharon Stone references. Mimi Craven left her husband for Sharon Stone. Okay. And so Wes Craven... Was there a video? Uh, unfortunately, no. no. Um, the thing about it is uh, Sharon Stone allegedly sent to Wes Craven two dozen black roses when his wife left him um, for her. So it's kind of odd that there are so many Sharon Stone like references and sort of jabs in these Scream <laughs> films. And I'm like, is that Wes talking or is that Kevin Williamson? Um, so anyway, I just thought I would point that out. Um, kind of an interesting That's bit of... more interesting than the score part. Isn't it, though? That's, yeah. The, that, that was like the bombshell of this whole thing. Like, wow. That was the juicy <laughs> part. Um, 
But anyway, Scream 2 opened in December, uh, almost a year to the day after the first one. Uh, It's kind of funny to mention in hindsight, uh, both the James Bond movie Tomorrow Never Dies and James Cameron's Titanic were pushed a week because they didn't want to compete with Scream 2. So, in hindsight, that's funny. Titanic was moved to avoid competition with Scream 2. Um, Scream well, 2 did, did not... have the next, like, 12 weeks mapped out. Yes. Well, I mean, Scream 2 obviously did not make a billion dollars, but it did make over a hundred million dollars in its first run, which ain't bad for a $24 million movie. And it's also an improvement on the gross of the first film, which is not always the case when you have sequels. Huge hit, uh, surpassed the first one. Um, I guess we could go around the room and, and say what each of us thought of the sequel in comparison to the original or just in general. But I think, I don't know, Zach, I think I know your opinion. What do you think of Scream 2? Better than the first one? Same? On par? Uh, I thought the first one was better, but uh, the second one I did like, though. Um, I thought it was good in its own way. Um, I thought it, I thought they did bring in good people, like good actors in it, uh, for the most part. And But yeah, I, I loved it. And I think that's where it kind of the first two kind of start to, well, we'll go into that another one. But, yeah, I, the first one's way better. Okay. All right. Rebecca? Um, I thought the first one was better. When I saw the second one, I was just kind of like, okay. I think, and um, whoever mentioned, you know, Jerry O'Connell earlier, I think I probably had the same thing. I was kind of like, that guy, you know. I mean, I, I you know, because I, I don't know. But, but in comparison of what's to come, yeah, it's it's not. Yeah, you, you appreciate. I appreciate it more now <laughs> yes. than when I did when I first saw it. At first, I was like, "Yeah, it's not as good. They're never as good as the first one." And then now, before I get to Ryan's opinion on this, I want you to raise your hand if you don't like Jerry O'Connell. Now, oh my God, are we getting all? Th- Ryan, I can't see your hand. It's, it's oh my, <laughs> we got three hands. <laughs> Three nays for Jerry O'Connell. Two or four if you count Zach twice. Wow. Nothing That's personal, a- though. It's like I don't want him to get hit by a car or anything. Yeah. See, the, you were telling oh, me yeah. that me- R- Ryan, you were telling me the Mimi Craven thing was the juicy part of the show. I'm <laughs> shocked by this that, that you guys hate Jerry O'Connell so much. I just never had well, any. Particularly in this movie. I just, I don't know what it was. I just kind of like that guy. Dude, when Jerry was, was up on the thing. And, and Hitman shot him. I thought that was, like, awesome. I was like, yeah. Yeah, F that guy. <laughs> you cheered. I love it. I love it. Fuck yeah, yeah Hitman. <laughs> it's, it's not anything he does. It, it's just, he's got this smugness about him. I don't know what it is. Like, I don't know. I love that I've made this discovery today. This is the most unexpected part of the show. <laughs> It makes me want to go through the whole cast and ask you to raise your hands. I mean, I'm fascinated now. Uh, but we, we don't have time to do that. We've about run out of the, damn it, we've run out of show. So we can't go through the cast. Um, but I think, I knew, oh, I'm sorry, Ryan. Yes, I did not get to you when I was asking your opinion of Scream 2 in, in relation to the first one or just in general. I'm not the biggest fan of like... Uh... You know, just because something's a sequel doesn't mean it has to be the same movie. You know, you could have sequels to things that are a continuation of a much bigger story. But uh, sequels like this that are nothing more than a play on whatever created it, you know, like the Final Destinations, you're just watching the, you know, which a couple of those I actually liked. I I, I liked some of the sequels to those, but I, I I was over it, you know, after the first one. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. So we've had some kind of varying opinions, people who love them, people who don't like them as much, and then sort of in between. So I think we've, we've kind of covered the gamut today, the whole spectrum of, of Scream 1 and 2. We will be back and talking about Scream 3 and 4. I have very, <laughs> I have very interesting opinions about Scream 3. I'll always remember Scream 4 because I was actually on the set shooting uh, You're Next when that came out. And uh, me and uh, 
my co-star Lane Hughes went to see Scream 4 together uh, uh, while we were in Missouri, so shooting your next. So I might tell you some stories about that when we get to the Scream 4 section of our next uh, Scream episode. But for now, we've run out of time. I want to thank Zach. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I want to thank Rebecca. Yep. And, of course, Ryan, the killer Rayanick. <laughs> and I want to thank suck all you guys. Suck my Russian balls. <laughs> suck, yes, Ryan, suck my Russian that's a, balls. That's an inside joke for the internet that they don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. But There you yeah. go. Well, now they do, sort of. Now they do. Um, okay, so we've reached the end of the show. I want to thank the audience for watching. As I said, I want to thank my co-hosts. And until next time, make sure to take care of yourselves.